of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. O God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people, that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you, who were once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he comes and proclaims peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, both of us have access to one spirit in the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the holy structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Word of God word of life. Thanks be to God. Good shepherd of my soul, come dwell
this narrow road with Christ before me. Where thorns and thistles grow and poison snare me. No doubt it and deny, he never leaves my side, but lifts my head and calls me to follow. Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away to the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. It was a great opportunity with the shoes that fit to come to a school and hand out shoes because you know that these these times are the ones that impact the kids the most and they also impact us as players. I can still remember you get your new pair of gym shoes when you're a kid and it's pretty exciting. All the kids were fitted by the organization. It's like special order. They loved it. Making a difference in the life of a child really is that simple. One pair of shoes can fill a child with confidence, hope, dignity, and joy. But old shoes or shoes that are too tight can bring a child pain, shame, and embarrassment. The reality is, this basic need often goes unmet for nearly 16 million children living in poverty right here in the United States. When you're a child, there's nothing more important than fitting in with friends and having fun at school. But how can you? when you're faced with ridicule and even physical pain because you're wearing shoes that are too small or too old or you're a boy who has no choice but to wear his sister's shoes. These are real shoes pulled from real kids who have been helped by shoes that fit over the last 25 years. All thanks to one woman's vision that individuals really can make a difference. How it got started was really the result of a casual dinner conversation with a woman that I never knew. She was a secretary at Roosevelt Elementary School in Pomona. A little boy came into the classroom crying that his feet hurt. His shoes were way too tiny. His parents had actually turned his toes under, shoved them into the shoes, laced them up, and sent him to school like that. I said, my God, that is awful. What did you do? She said, well, we massaged his feet 
and put his shoes back on him and sent him back to class. I said, that sounds barbaric. Why didn't you just buy him a pair of shoes? And she said, oh, we have hundreds of kids like him. We wouldn't know where to start. A lot of times we see a need, but the immensity of it is so great that people freeze. They can't think what to do. I think Shoes That Fit gives people a way to make their community better. From the very beginning, Shoes That Fit partnered with volunteers to do the program right in their own community and worked directly with schools to identify the kids who needed shoes the most. It's not just about having a pencil and paper these days. This is about them having, you know, all of the resources that are vital to being 21st century learners. And of course, a brand new pair of shoes makes sure that they can be active, they can run, they can be social on the playground. Ensuring that kids are successful inside and outside the classroom is a value that Shoes That Fit shares with its volunteers, donors, partner schools, and its corporate sponsors like Nordstrom. The Nordstrom partnership really started because of Michelle Love. She always talked about the Nordstrom family as being her family. When she heard about Shoes That Fit, she wanted to help immediately. We were founded in 1901 as a shoe business. So at the very root or core of our business is footwear. So right off the bat, we had a natural fit with this organization. One of our top priorities is youth, and that's where Shoes That Fit really is a great marriage for us. To date, Nordstrom and Shoes That Fit have delivered 110,000 pairs of shoes to kids in need through their holiday campaign. Last Christmas, I was at one of our rack stores, and an employee came up to me and said that he was one of our Shoes That Fit kids. Turns out he was young and he was on the streets, he was homeless, and he found shoes that fit. We were able to give him some clothing and a new pair of shoes, and he got a job at McDonald's. From there, he saved enough money, bought a few more things, and we hired him at Nordstrom. And he's one of our best employees today. During the holidays, customers can purchase giving cards. 100% of the funds raised go directly towards providing new shoes to children in need. I believe the majority of people want to do good. They just don't know how. And so when we rolled out the program, customers are like, oh boy, I can partner with Nordstrom, a company they trust, I can give my money, and I know I'm doing good work. So it was a win-win for everyone. Building on the support of that relationship, Shoes That Fit is preparing to launch into its next phase of growth and service with a goal of doubling the number of kids helped each year and they need all hands on deck to help raise money, find shoe sources, and gain support from individuals and corporations to ensure that every child who needs new shoes for school gets new shoes for school. The collective power of the people in this room to give is unbelievable. If we harness that and we focus it and we make a decision to help kids who need a brand new pair of shoes, then we should do that. And we've already got some momentum, like support from L.A. Clippers star Chris Paul. We're here with the Chris Paul Family Foundation providing brand new athletic shoes for every child at Barack Obama Charter School. Shoes That Fit has been a great partnership in that there's so many different things that we take for granted on a daily basis and a pair of shoes is one of them. It's hard to imagine, I think, for many of us, but for a low-income family, sometimes you know, the choice between feeding your children or buying them new shoes is pretty obvious what's going to win. And if you just remember when you got new shoes as a kid, you stand up tall. These kids take the shoes out of the box and just start running around and they feel so good about themselves and the Los Angeles Galaxy. When you see these faces and one individual opening one pair of shoes that maybe have never had a brand new pair of shoes or maybe had even a pair of shoes that actually fit them, it can change their whole demeanor in the classroom and out of the classroom. Having them have the confidence walking into school every day is what we're here for and the L.A. Kings. We wanted them to have something that was their own, that was special, that would really empower them to go out and just tackle the world and be better prepared to just learn and play. Oh my the reality is, there is still a need. The leaders of tomorrow are in America's classrooms right now. The next political leader, or astronaut, or doctor, could be just waiting for you to believe in him or her. 
Because when you give a child in need a new pair of shoes, you're also giving them hope. You're filling them with confidence because they now know that someone believes in them. The impact is clear. The smiles are unforgettable. Changing the life of a child really is as simple as a pair of shoes. Won't you join us? The little boy had done something wrong. So his mom picked him up and put him in his playpen and told him that he couldn't get out until she told him he could. This pained the little boy to no end. You see, the little boy's grandfather was scheduled to come over and play with him and would be there in the next five minutes or so. When the grandfather arrived, he too was sad that his grandson was not allowed to come out of the playpen and play with him. And so the grandfather asked his daughter if the little boy could play with him, even though he couldn't come out of the playpen. The boy's mom said she had no problem with him playing, just so long as he stayed in the playpen. And so the grandfather had a great idea. If his grandson could, couldn't come out and play with him, then the grandfather would pull his pants legs up, gingerly climb over the top of the playpen and play with the little boy there. And that's exactly what he did. He climbed down into where his grandson sat and they played. When evening came, the boat was put out to the sea and Jesus was alone on the land. When he saw that they were straining at the oars against an adverse wind, he came towards them early in the morning, walking on the sea. He intended to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for all they saw made them terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. I love the story of Jesus and his disciples. The text states that Jesus sees and is aware that the disciples are out to sea, straining to keep their boat from flipping over. They are working doubly hard to cut through the strong wind and choppy waves. Jesus knows they're in trouble. And so he gets up and starts to walk towards them on water. This is good news. Jesus is going to give these poor souls a hand. God knows they need it. But then the text throws us for a loop. Verse 48, second part. And he came towards them early in the morning, walking on the sea. He intended to pass them by. Don't you just love that part added in? I mean, wow. Looks like their boat's about to sink or at least flip over. I think I'll walk towards them and lend a hand. No, I think I'll just walk on by and let them fend for themselves. After all, I'm not always going to be around to bail them out. All 26 of these verses serve a twofold purpose. One, they seek to inform us that we need to get things worked out because Jesus isn't always going to be able to come to rescue us. And two, they seek to uncover, to reveal just how much and what exactly do we trust and put our trust in. In Jesus' mind, the disciples should already know that he's not going to let anything happen to them. But they clearly don't understand this, which is why he ends up coming to them after all. It's a trust thing for Jesus. The disciples also are being tested to see if they can make a go on their own without Jesus. He was going to walk by them, I think, to see exactly how they were going to handle this adverse wind. For the remainder of Jesus' ministry, his life, there are going to be plenty of adverse winds that will have to be faced by the disciples. And so he uses the boat on the stormy sea to measure just how much work he still has left to do with the disciples. Then he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. That's verse 50. Notice this passage comes after the passage where Jesus is still standing on the water, presumably within a short distance where the disciples can hear him. 
And interestingly enough, the adverse wind continues at that point. After the disciples realize it's Jesus that has approached and not some ghost crawling across the water, he does a little pastoral counseling. He says, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Basically, he is telling them to pick their hearts up off the floor of the boat, to recognize that it's him, their rabbi, their teacher, standing there before them, and then to realize there's no need to be afraid to begin with. But the adverse wind continues. Just then, Jesus gets into the boat with them and the wind ceases. There's a monumental nuance here for the time we spend with each other on this earth, but I'm going to hold off on telling you what it is just for a moment because I want to tell you a story. And to tell the story, I have to go back for a second to an experience that had a profound impact on me. Uh, And it happened when Shonda and I lived in Illinois at our previous church there. Whenever I would leave the church office, there were actually several uh, paths, routes that I would take to go home. And I like to take a different one every time just to mix it up and vary the travel a bit. Uh, One of the ways that I would travel home took me down a road past a beautifully well-built brick house on a corner. But lately I had been noticing that there were had been trash collecting in the front yard. I noticed a lot of bikes just being left out on the sidewalk. And when I was coming home one particular day, I noticed a little girl, maybe four or five years old, who was playing dangerously close to this busy street. She would jump across the white line and then jump back as though she were playing some sort of game. I watched all of this unfold as an SUV was barreling down on her direction, uh, in, in the opposite direction. And at that time, the little girl was back in her driveway. But the closer this car got, the more this little girl inched towards the line on the road. I said a quick prayer, and just about the time the car was about to pass the little girl's driveway, the little girl jumped out into the street. The SUV slammed on its brakes, swerved into my lane of traffic right in front of me, and then swerved back just in time to miss my car. The SUV stopped and pulled off to the side of the road, and she looked over her shoulder and just stared at the little girl. And then she turned and looked at me because I also had to stop and had pulled off to the side of the road. And this woman had this look on her face of, well, aren't you going to do something? And the look on my face was, well, no, aren't you going to do something? And so we both drove off in different directions. I pulled into my street and stopped my car so I could watch from a distance to see what the little girl was going to do next. I thought that surely someone had to be watching her from a window in their home and would surely be out shortly. But I sat there for another five minutes or so, and I never saw a single person come out to bring the little girl back into the house. To make matters worse, she continued to hop back and forth, back and forth across the white line of the road's shoulder. I pulled away to where I couldn't see her any longer, and I told God to leave me alone. Because I hadn't seen my family all day, it wasn't a great day at work. On top of it, Shonda was supposed to go out with friends, and I was already running 10 minutes late for her to be able to leave, and I was just flat out tired. I pulled up to the stop sign just before my house where I could either go straight and be home in a minute, or I could turn left and circle back around to the little girl's home. I circled back around. When the little girl saw me pull into her driveway, she quickly ran back inside. And I'm thinking, well, that's a start. She's not scared of getting hit by a car or jumping in and out of the road, but she's scared of strangers. This is good. I got out of my car, walked up, to the porch and knocked on the front door. Another slightly older girl appeared and just smiled at me, stared at me, and eventually a young boy came to the door and asked if he could help me, and I asked him if he could go and get his dad or mom for me. Well, several minutes passed and his mom came down the stairs. She stepped outside to talk to me, and I told her that it was none of my business, but from the looks of things inside and outside of the house, it seemed that she had hit a patch of bad luck. And I told her that I wanted to help in some way. I wasn't sure what I could do, but I wanted to help. She immediately began to cry and and tell me about her family and the shape of things in her life. She invited me in to sit down and we talked. The house was in really bad shape. She introduced herself, Jane. I came to learn that Jane had seven seven children, all of whom were living at home. 
and ranged in age from four to 16. There were four boys and three girls. Jane's husband was in prison for domestic abuse. There was no sign that he would be getting out anytime soon to either help or make matters worse. I asked Jane to make a list of what she considered to be her family's short-term and long-term needs and told her I would be back the same time the very next day to pick up that list and to talk with her about next steps we could take. And so I came back the next day and she gave me that list. I asked if it would be okay if I came back the very next day with some friends to help her and the kids begin to clean up the house. She told me that would be great. So the following day, a group from my previous church joined me and we went over and cleaned up the house. It was a very difficult day, but it was also a day of celebration. The kids were proud of their clean rooms, maybe for the first time in their lives. One of the boys couldn't wait to invite one of his friends over to see just how clean his room was. There were a lot of things this family were going to need if they were to have a shot of remaining a family and having an opportunity to thrive in their lives. Each of the seven children needed new bed mattresses at a minimum. They also needed clothes, school supplies, medical care, dentistry work, and supportive services. This family was in the throes of a very powerful adverse wind. They did not ask to be in this wind, in this storm. They were straining at the oars against this wind, this storm. I first attempted to pass them by. After all, I didn't know them. And and you might even say they weren't my problem. I didn't owe them anything. If the little girl was struck and killed by a car, I mean, that really wasn't my concern. It wasn't my child. But that's not who I am. That's not how I want to be remembered when I'm gone from this planet one day. The disciples did not ask Jesus to get in their boat any more than this family invited me to get into their life, into their boat. I'm certainly no Jesus, but I am pleased to say I want to be more like him every day of my life. Every day I I want to improve at least just 1%. Jesus was not planning on stopping at the disciples' boat, but he saw what was happening to them. And so he got into the boat. They didn't ask him to get into the boat. He made a decision that they were going to be in great danger. If he simply just sat at the shore, if he stayed out from a distance and and didn't get into their boat. Sometimes we have to make those get in the boat decisions. The world we know does not value people who ask for help. And so what we end up doing is sentencing people to a kind of miserable hell of silence and desperation, quiet desperation. If you're in trouble, we think it's more honorable to dig a hole so deep that you'll never be able to get out of it on your own. But that's not right. There are times when we have to stop whatever it is we're doing, stop where, wherever it is we're going and get into someone's boat instead. We have to disrupt our plans and get in the boat. Believe it or not, I didn't stop on my own behalf at Jane's home. I circled back around with my church family in my heart. I stopped at that house only because of the promise of what the local church can be for communities, I believe is the only thing stronger than families who have hit rock bottom and cannot get to the surface or to the light on their own. In a day and age where we know there are tens of thousands of families just like Jane's family, that we don't even know about. Thank God that this family could be seen and heard. We should all be so fortunate when the opportunity to serve is placed so visibly in our pathway. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. I bet you don't have to think very long about a boat in your life that needs you to get in it. I'm all for people figuring out how to solve their problems without others being involved. That's an important skill to learn in this life. But I also know we don't always know when or even how to ask others for help. So sometimes we have to jump into someone else's boat, someone else's storm, and do our best to quiet the storm. You never know what difference that might make. You might just save someone else's life you might just save your own. We know about another story in the Gospels about having uh, faith and courage to step out of the boat and trust Jesus, but that's not this story. This story is about you having the faith and courage to get into someone else's boat and ride out the storm with them. So don't be afraid to get into the boat with someone to help calm the storm in their lives. 
to see the boat safely to shore because someone else's life might just depend on it. Amen. Beloved, God's chosen, rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. Tend your church, O God. Encourage bishops, pastors, and deacons in their proclamation of the gospel. Raise up new leaders and encourage all those pursuing a call to ministry. Embolden all the baptized to embody your love and justice. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Restore your creation, O God. Sustain croplands and pastures and safeguard all farm animals and livestock. Preserve lakes, rivers, and streams that offer refreshment. Revive lands recovering from natural disasters and protect coastlands threatened by rising oceans. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Reconcile the nations, O God. Break down the dividing walls that make us strangers to one another and unite us as one human family. Equip leaders to deal wisely with conflict and guide diplomats who seek peaceful solutions. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Heal your people, O God. Look with with compassion on immigrants, exiles, and all who are afraid or feel lost. Give rest to those who are weary, comfort those who are grieving, and recovery to those who are ill, especially those we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Nourish this congregation, O God. Prepare a table where we receive food for our hungering spirits. Renew our commitment to provide for one another and revitalize our ministries of feeding and nurturing hungry neighbors. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You lead us home, O God. We give thanks for all who have died, now citizens with the saints. As you have received them into your heavenly home, so welcome all of us to dwell in your house forever. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always and also with you. Share that sign of peace with one another. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our honor and joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna here on earth. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the night of which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it 
and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the fruits of God for the people of God. Come to the table. All are welcome. For the gifts of God are free. Amen.
let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.